All right, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming uh, tonight. We might uh, get the, uh, the discussion started. Um, so my name's Chris. Um, I'm from the Campaign Against Racism and Fascism. Um, and uh, you're here tonight at a CAF forum uh, called Making a Murderer, um, how the Australian state um, led to the growth of the far right. Um, so uh, before we begin, um, and before I introduce the panelists, I think we should acknowledge that uh, this meeting is taking place um, on the land of the Wurundjeri people. Um, it's land that was stolen, it was never ceded, um, and in CAF uh, we stand uh, with um, Aboriginal people in their uh, righteous struggle uh, for sovereignty um, and for, um, for rights. Um, so um, I'll introduce all of the panellists first and then get the first speaker to come up. So um, the panellists tonight are uh, Jeff Sparrow, um, who's a writer, uh, editor and broadcaster. Um, we have Nada, um, who is a RMIT student um, and the uh, Vice President of the um, RMIT Islamic Society. Um, we have Tim uh, Lasudo um, from uh, Democracy in Colour, um, which is a, a P POC, People of Colour led um, uh, political uh, and campaign uh, organisation. And we also have Nawi, um, who is a member of CAF. So uh, basically the meeting, the reason for the meeting tonight um, on the forum tonight is that um, in the wake um, of Christchurch, um, we saw basically um, an amazing, um, on the one hand, um, a really amazing response from ordinary people um, in solidarity uh, with the Muslim community um, against this far right attack. But we also saw um, pretty repulsive um, responses from our political leaders, from media commentators, um, and so on. Everywhere from everyone from you know Fraser Anning to Scott Morrison, Andrew Bolt. Um, and so on. And so I think it's uh, tonight, the reason for putting this meeting on is to have a discussion about what are the political effects um, after uh, Christchurch, uh, after the fact. Uh, but without uh, further ado, um, I'll introduce, um, yeah, I'll get Jeff to come up and um, say a few words. Thanks. We're about 10 minutes, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, you maybe um, tell us after about 10 minutes. Thanks very much for um, the invitation to speak at this uh, important meet meeting because I think we are faced with some very important um, issues to discuss in the wake of the horrific events um, at Christchurch. In the months to come, we're going to learn a great deal more about the perpetrator of this atrocity. We already know that he inherited money and used that money to travel across Europe where he was in contact with a variety of fascist organisations in France, in Austria and other countries. But we also know that the fascist milieu that was most important to the perpetrator was the Australian fascist milieu. You'll remember that before he went off to commit these mass murders, he'd been posting on social media using an avatar um, featuring the Australian shit posters meme, which was associated with the alt-right dingoes podcast. He'd signed off thanking his cobbers on um, 4chan. Um, we know from one of the local leaders of the United Patriots Front, the main fascist organisation in Australia, a fellow called Tom Sewell, in a discussion on a closed um, blog, he said that the perpetrator was well known in fascist circles in Australia. And we also have now, courtesy of the ABC, some data about the perpetrator's interactions with the local um, fascist organi organisations, even though their social media has been deleted. We know that he was a big supporter of both the UPF and another small fascist group called the True Blue Crew, and in fact donated money to the UPF. It's not clear at this stage whether anyone else was involved in the um, specifics of his uh, murder spree, and that may come out in the months to come. But what I think we can say is the Australian fascist milieu was very important in creating a climate in which political violence was normalised in a way that I think was very important to the perpetrator. So the data that the ABC has um, uncovered shows that the uh, perpetrator was a big supporter 
of the UPF leader Blair Cottrell, the main ideologue of National Socialism in Australia. The perpetrator referred to him at one point as his emperor. And what is it that he liked about Cottrell? Well, Cottrell, as an avowed National Socialist, has made his commitment to political violence as a method of social change and a method of exterminating his political enemies repeatedly clear. On one Twitter post, he boasted that um, when he was in power, his enemies would be forced to leave the country and those that didn't leave would be executed. And this is uh, very much the sentiment that the perpetrator of the Christchurch massacre expressed in his manifesto. Um, it's also very much the sentiment that we know, courtesy of the ABC, he expressed in comments on the UPF's Facebook sites, where in particular, after one demonstration, he addressed um, anti-fascist protesters, people like you, directly, and said, um, you should all be executed, and when the time comes for you to be executed, I'll be holding the rope. And of course, at the time, these comments attracted no particular attention because anyone who's familiar with the social media output of the Australian fascist organisations know they are awash with comments like that. They are a litany of calls for people to be shot, to be murdered, to be bashed, to be um, inflicted with violence of one kind or another. Now, of course, you know, social media is full of hyperbole and full of bluster, and it would be easy to dismiss this kind of rhetoric as more shitposting, you know, just harmless chatter. But I think the real contribution to, of the local fascist scene to this atrocity is the connection that they made between online chatter of this kind and real world political violence. And they did this in all sorts of ways, that the leaders of the UPF, not just Cottrell, but all the other main figures, explicitly said they are in favour of exterminating their enemies. They said this over and over again. But they also went out of their way to make clear that they knew where their enemies were and they knew how to target them. So the most notorious um, demonstration of this was the visit of senior um, UPF members to the Melbourne Anarchist Club. I'm sure some of you will remember this incident where four of the UPF cater went to the Anarchist Club in Northcote, came into the building, stole some of the pamphlets and filmed and intimidated the people there. And this was an intervention that was clearly meant to send a message. We know where you are and we can get you if we want. And this was particularly intimidating because, of course, Cottrell, who was one of the people there, has a history of violent crime, being um, incarcerated at one point precisely for stalking someone he perceived to be his enemy and threatening to burn down his house. So when a figure like that turns up at a place where you're not expecting him, this is intimidatory. It's meant to be intimidatory. It's meant to say the violence we talk about is something we can actually do. But, of course, we subsequently learned that uh, Cottrell was not the most dangerous person who um, entered the Melbourne, Melbourne Anarchist Club on that occasion. He was accompanied by someone called Chris Shortis, who later appeared in a major feature in The Age, where it was revealed uh, he is a biblical fundamentalist who believes he's waging a holy war against Islam, which he says should be fought with extreme brutality. He's also someone who collects firearms and was featured in that uh, piece, bare-chested, clutching um, an automatic um, rifle and a number of pistols. And at the time, the age consulted an expert on the far right who said, this man is the next Anders Breivik. So already, and this is in 2016, people are talking about this Malou as creating someone who is capable of um, committing mass murder. But of course, it turned out that Shortus wasn't the most dangerous person that we were dealing with in respect of the Melbourne Anarchist Club.
club. That dubious honour goes to a guy called Phil Galea, who you may have heard of, who was in fact arrested by the Victoria Police and charged with multiple counts of terrorism. Specifically, he was planning a bomb attack on Melbourne Trades Hall, on the Resistance Centre in Swanson Street, and the Melbourne Anarchist Centre, the same place that Cottrell and the others had explicitly said is something that should be targeted. Not only was he planning a bomb attack, he had gone some way to acquire the materials for that bomb attack. And um, in his um, trial, other people said that uh, he wanted to torture people on the left. He was compiling a torture manual. Uh, and he was doing this because he thought it was important that the right knew how to um, how to hurt the left. And Galea had at various times been arrested, going to demonstrations, carrying weapons, and nobody had done anything or said anything about it. And I think what you see from this is the entire scene was awash with people who could have been um, the perpetrator of the Christchurch massacre, who could have been the next Anders Breivik. And in fact, many people said at the time, it is a matter of time before an atrocity like this um, takes place. And it's not, you know, it's with no satisfaction that you say that, in fact, um, we were right about that. Now, the difference between the perpetrator of this atrocity in New Zealand and, um, and the local fascist scene wasn't to do with the question of violence because they were both committed to the violent extermination of their enemies because this is a central facet of um, fascism. Um, the real difference was that he was committed to a particular form of this extermination, which was um, terrorism. And I think that's really interesting because actually if you read his manifesto and if you read the manifestos of other recent far-right terrorists, what they say is um, contemporary, the contemporary Nazi movement is not growing. In fact, the contemporary Nazi movement is in crisis. And you can see that really clearly in Australia. It's a little bit different in other countries, but in Australia, it's clear that the UPF has collapsed. It's clear they haven't been able to build anything. And because of that, some of them are now turning to terrorism. And they're turning to terrorism out of despair at their ability to create the kind of movement that they wanted to create. So in some respects, I think this is a good thing. Yeah, it's symptomatic of the work that people here and others have done to marginalise these figures. Um, and, you know, to send them turning inwards on each other where they're all fighting and they've all split and they're now in tiny fractured groups. But what it also means that precisely because they're weakened, they are now more likely to carry out this kind of um, terrorism that we saw in Christchurch. And that's why I think it's really important that we take this threat seriously. One aspect of that is recognise that this Malou is dangerous. It's not a joke. It's not, you know, something you write a funny book about hanging out with, um, you know, Nazis and how zany they are or anything like that. You know, these people are, are dangerous and I think it's quite likely something like this will happen again. There's any number of people in the scene who you could expect to see do something like this again. But the second facet of that, I think, is that it's really important to, to borrow an expression from, somewhere, from someone to drain the swamp, to destroy the sources that give these people legitimacy, that give them a voice um, in the public sphere. Because even though organisationally they are tremendously weak, on social media they have an extraordinary reach, far more than you would expect, and they have an access to the mainstream that is far more than you would expect. You know, Cotra was on fucking Triple J. Um, uh, so I think that those are the two facets of a successful response to these people, to take them seriously, to combat them when they uh, raise their heads, but also to destroy the, um, the mainstream political forces that give them some legitimacy. Pauline Hansen is going to be in Melbourne uh, this Friday. Um, and one of the things that uh, CAF um, does regularly and I think does well um, is whenever these far right figures come uh, to our city, uh, to Melbourne or to you know, uh, where we can get to, uh, we make sure to give these people hell. Uh, we make sure to give them the welcome they deserve. So we have a rally. Um, we've called the rally for this Friday. Um, the 
Pauline Hansen is going to be meeting in Sunbury, uh, which if anyone knows what that is, it's a bit of a drive. So we're going to be uh, meeting in trades, a trades hall first um, and we'll organise cars and so on to ferry people out um, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, give our, um, you know, our visitor from Queensland a piece of our minds. So the next... Um, and the thing I'll say as well is that at the end of the panel of speakers, there'll be time for discussion and so on. Um, but the next speaker I wanted to introduce um, is uh, Nada. Uh, Nada is an RMIT student um, and she is the vice president of the RMIT Islamic Student Society. So please make Nada feel welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace and mercy and blessings of Allah be upon you all. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Rawanji people of Kilan Nations. Hajj Dawood Nabi, 71. A grandfather of nine, a humanitarian, a community leader, a shaheed, a martyr. Naim Rashid, 50. A heroic leader, a loving father, a community leader, an educator, a shaheed, a martyr. Linda Armstrong, 56. A grandmother, a sister, a community leader, a brave mother, a shaheeda, a martyr. Husseini Arapavan, 42 a wife, a caring mother, a brave hero, a shahida, a martyr. Hamza Mustafa, 16. A beloved son, a caring brother, a wise friend, a shahid, a martyr. Mukad Ibrahim, three. Was a beloved son, was a beloved baby, was a beloved brother, was a young soul, but now a shaheed, a martyr. That is a glimpse of the 51 brothers and sisters that fell victim to the terrorist attack nearly one month ago. May God grant them the highest level of Jannah, Paradise, Amin. Islam prides itself as being a religion of mercy and compassion. However, it also prides itself as being a religion of truth and justice. The truth is 51 peaceful, innocent and worshipping souls were deliberately killed by a terrorist on the 15th of March in Christchurch, New Zealand. That very following week, more than 150 Muslims were killed and murdered in Fulani, Mali. Both acts were carried by terrorists that targeted them, terrorists that targeted us. Terrorists that are fed with right-wing extremism, fed with hatred, fed with bigotry, fed with Islamophobia. Nothing that is new to us. It is not something that has happened overnight. It's a method adapted for decades by those in power to gain votes and implement stereotypes and their ill propaganda that affects us as Muslims, us as humans, us as Australians. Some may have heard about the Eskimos. In the Eskimos language, there is 26 different words to describe the word snow. Something as simple as snow. So it begs the question, how can something as simple as snow be described with so many words and something that is one word, racism, that is explained with just one word, racism? Racism comes in many different forms. The most obvious one being blatant racism. We observe it by certain bigoted politicians like Fraser Anning and Pauline Hansen. However, there are other types of racism we tend to often miss. Namely, unintentional racism, structural racism, institutional racism, racism mixed in with sexism, and there's so many more. We are confronted with subtle racism, 
where people tend to have a pre-biased conception when dealing with certain groups, and that leads to treating these groups in a different way to the norm. When Rupert Murdoch releases 2,000 articles in Australia alone with concept of Islamophobia, that's how subtle racism works. Common solutions expressed by many is, I don't see colour. But that's only allowing for progression in the wrong path. It's creating a short-term solution in, which sweeps the problem under the rug. We need to see colour. We need to acknowledge certain groups that are constantly being considered the other. Muslims, owners of the land, the indigen indigenous, Africans, Asian, Palestinians, and the list can go on and on. These terrorists, politicians, people in power are many that surround every corner of this globe. They try to divide us. They try to weaken our iman, our faith, our peace, but that is not going to happen. This has united us. This has shown us true solidarity. This has allowed many of us to finally stand up and hold those accountable. Call them out for their bigotry. Call them out for their hate. Call them out in a petition. Call them out in a protest. Call them out on election day. Call them out in our prayers. To my Muslim brothers and sisters out there, attend your prayers, attend your lectures. Be Muslim. Be you. To our fellow non-Muslims out there, please ask us any questions. Please educate yourself on the true Islam. And don't hesitate. Being a Muslim and attending recent protests showed me the increase in those that have shown us solidarity, that have shown us love, that have shown us support, that have shown us care, compassion in dark times. So thank you. Thank you for showing me that in times like this, humanity can prevail. To the socialist group out there that are constantly organizing events like this today and bringing awareness and light to an issue we are affected by, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Muslim community on, on RMIT. <clears throat> By organizing such events, this shows that this can unite us and you can accept us for our differences. I'd like to end on, we will not let this injustice be forgotten. We will not forget those that stood by us. We will forever, inshallah, keep you in our prayers and forever fight for our rights till we live in peace. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Nada. Um, it was a terrific, uh, yeah, terrific speech. Um, one thing um, that Nada mentioned was um, some of the activism that's happened. And like I said, CAF is an um, activist organization. And after um, the Christchurch, the, after the um, rally we had um, in solidarity with the Muslim community after Christchurch, um, our next organizing meeting was packed uh, to the rafters. And we want to be able to continue um, you know, bringing more people in in an ongoing way uh, to take on the far right and racism um, in this city. So um, I'd ask again now, could you pass around? There's um, a staying in touch uh, list. Um, so if you haven't seen it already, I know a few people have put their names down already, but if you haven't, I would urge you to put your name down so that you can stay in touch with us, whether it's to come along to the anti Pauline Hanson rally uh, this Friday or to come along to our future meetings and future events and so on. Um, it'd be really good if every person in this room that came along tonight um, made some commitment to um, taking on the far right and racism um, in an ongoing way. So the next speaker I had uh, was Tim. Um, yeah, Tim, uh, like I said, is uh, from uh, Democracy in Color. It's a, a POC-led um, organizing um, and advocacy um, body, so please make Tim feel welcome. I think we should be pretty explicit and clear that uh, the Christchurch attack was, you know, manifest out of white supremacy uh, and that we can't talk about dismantling white supremacy if we're not also talking about how we're centering the fight for indigenous and first nation sovereignty and self-determination. Self They're one and the same thing. Like if you want to talk about how this thing happened and you look at 230 years of colonization of stolen land, of stolen children, of rape, of massacre, of genocide in this country. Uh, so that's really what I want to talk about. Um, uh, you know, how did we get here? That's what the commentators asks, right? The, the talking heads. 
how did we get here? You know, what a fucking joke of a question, right? I mean, this country is like, like a goldfish, you know? We have the election of Pauline Hanson, and then we remember that we're, you know, structurally racist country, and then a couple months later we forget, and then we have, you know, some Nazis gather and have a fucking rally on St Kilda, and then we remember again, we're racist, and then we forget, and then Fraser Anning gives his final solution, first speech, and then we remember, and then we forget, and then this happens, right? You know, at least 50, 51 uh, innocent people killed whilst at prayer in Christchurch. Uh, because we don't, you know, we can't wrestle with the fact that structural racism is ingrained in the DNA of this country. Uh, and whilst the Christchurch terror attack was many things, right? It was terrifying, it was horrifying, it was infuriating, it was devastating, it was many things. The one thing it wasn't was surprising because it's not surprising when you look at this year's, this country's 230 year history of colonisation, of stealing land, of stealing children. It's not surprising when this country incarcerates the most Indigenous people in the planet. And it's not surprising when Indigenous women are the fastest growing incarcerated group on the planet. It's not surprising when Indigenous kids are at least 25 times more likely to be incarcerated than non-Indigenous kids. And it's not surprising when senior ministers and a couple of prime ministers participate and cultivate this racialised crime panic that criminalises African Australians for their skin colour. And it's certainly not surprising when we have elected neo-Nazis in our parliament. So let's be clear, the Christchurch terror attack was not a surprise. Uh, it was not an aberration. It was a natural conclusion of years, of decades, of political con artists weaponising our differences and getting us to point the finger of blame, getting us to shout at each other. Uh, and the desperate scapegoating of the Muslim community over many years by people like Pauline Hanson, by Fraser Anning, by George Christensen, Tony Abbott, Peter Dutton, the list goes on, uh, has normalised the kind of fear and hate that was at the core, the heart of the Christchurch terror attack. And whilst many have contributed to this, and I named a few of them, and whilst we like to talk about people like Fraser Anning, because they say, you know, the things that are deliberately designed to get us angry, you know, the most outrageous, the most evil, the most horrifying things, designed to get us really angry so we share their, their outrageous press releases and we get really amped up and we give them the attention that they want. I want to talk about the people who appear moderate, you know, a little bit more moderate than the, than the extreme fucking eggplants out on the, out on the far right. Uh, people like Scott Morrison. I want to specifically talk about Scott Morrison because the most dangerous are those who are in power, positions of power, who can make decisions that affect our lived reality uh, and are very skilled communicators and can appear uh, uh, like your, your moderate uh, uh, average voices. And we don't need to go far back to look at how Scott Morrison's actions and people like him have cultivated the environment in which attacks like Christchurch thrive. You just look at a week ago, right? A week ago to the day, last Tuesday's federal budget. Uh, in that federal budget, you know, Scott Morrison was talking about cutting the, the migration cap, cap for a long time. In the federal uh, budget last Tuesday, he officially cut our migration cap by 30,000. Of course, he'll cite, you know, congestion and, uh, you know, cost of living as his reasons, but you know, he won't talk about how we've got policy that uh, prioritises the interests of developers. He won't talk about how successive governments have failed to invest in long-term infrastructure and public transport. He won't talk about that because that's uh, a little bit too convenient. In our federal government, there was $12 million for the, this is a fucking joke, for the, 200, for the 250th anniversary of Captain Cook's uh, invasion. Uh, in Australia and the replica Endeavour ship to circumnavigate the country. $12 million. Uh, you could fucking put... You could burn $12 million and it would be a better use of that spend. Uh, the $129 million to extend the paternalistic cashless welfare card and $185 million to reopen the Christmas Island Detention Centre. I want to talk a little bit about that for a bit. Now, of course, we all know when the Medivac bill was being debated... Uh, Morrison claimed it would cost billions of dollars, right? It would cost billions of dollars to reopen uh, uh, the Christmas Island uh, detention centre. Um, Australians would be kicked off. Do you remember this claim? Australians would be kicked off healthcare waiting lines uh, and that rapists, pedophiles and murderers would come into this country uh, because of this bill. 
And so Morrison committed $1.4 billion over four years to reopen the Christmas Island Detention Centre. And in early March, he flew over there and he brought a, a whole bunch of journalists over there too, at great expense, uh, to do this, this great big press conference. Because he wanted to, in his paraphrasing his words, he wanted to make sure Australians knew that that detention centre was ready to run. Uh, and of course, we learned in last Tuesday... We learnt in last Tuesday that that detention centre will close before July 1 and not a single refugee has been transferred there. So in essence, our government, Scott Morrison, has spent more than $185 million on a press conference. So this is a sort of, not, it's not just evil, right? It's not just cynicism. It's just relentless, uh, relentless, you know, pure political bastardry of these people that think they can... They can use our families, our communities, for, you know, whatever it takes, as long as the end goal is the pursuit and increase of their own power. And the best example, oh, it's uh, probably a bit rich to call it the best example. There's so many great examples of Morrison's hypocrisy. But one of the great examples of Morrison's hypocrisy was a few weeks ago, you know, it wasn't even a week after the Christchurch attack, he did this speech about calling for... Um, uh, a better standard of public debate. I don't know if, if anybody remembers his speech. It's a pr pretty big speech. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he railed against uh, sort of the, the us and them rhetoric. Uh, the hypocrisy, you know, the audacity. It goes beyond hypocrisy. The audacity of someone like Scott Morrison to claim uh, uh, that we need a better standard of public speech when this is the same man who used the Burke Street attack last year to call Islam a dangerous and radical ideology. This is the same man who urged his former cabinet colleagues uh, to, to capitalise on anti-Muslim fear in the community. And this is the same man who built his entire political career on the demonisation of asylum seekers, turning asylum seekers into, uh, into political punching bags. So this guy is a professional fear monger. This guy is a race-baiting race expert. He's a chief architect of offshore uh, torture camps that have abused thousands of innocent people. And he's a, a power-hungry uh, political operative who personifies the very worst of this country. Uh, but whilst we talk about Scott Morrison, it's important to remember that they all, all are, right? It doesn't matter, you know, what the head of the snake looks like. Whether it's Morrison, whether it's Turnbull, whether it's Peter Dutton, it doesn't really matter because they're all just different faces of the same broken system that exploits our dignity, our bodies and our aspirations to ensure that it props up a system that works very well for a small elite at the perpetual expense of the opportunity and dignity of everyone else. Uh, it, it's about propping up a system that enables, you know, skyrocketing, skyrocketing profits for big banks that enables... Uh, uh, corporations, mega corporations and billionaires to get away with paying zero dollars in tax while there are 100,000 Australians who are homeless, while there are 2.9 million Australians who live below the poverty line and whilst people like you and I have billions of dollars stolen from us in terms of you know, lost taxes from our schools, our hospitals, our central public services. That's what's on the line and that system is propped up by people like Scott Morrison uh, and his, his, uh, his crew who get us to shout at each other, who get us to point the finger of blame at each other, who get us to, to believe that our neighbour is the enemy instead of the broken rules and the billionaire oligarchs. So uh, there's an opportunity coming up. Uh, obviously, there's a lot we need to do to break this cruel, perverse, broken system. But an immediate opportunity is coming up in terms of the May federal election. We need to get rid of this government. This government's been four years, eight years overdue. Its use by date is way, way long gone. So you need to make sure, you know, we're coming along to, to actions like this is important, to forums like this is important. Come along to the Friday event, make sure that Pauline Hanson is, is run out of Melbourne, but also make sure that you're talking to folks uh, in marginal electorates, that you go door knocking for a candidate that you like, or go door knocking for an issue organisation that is something that you believe in uh, because we need to be talking to folks and making sure that they're not voting for a government uh, and for a political party that has nobody's interests except billionaires and their selves at heart. So let's make sure we show people this federal election and every day afterwards that if you weaponise our differences, if you use our families, our communities as their personal punching bags for their own personal gain, we'll get rid of them. You know, we'll, uh, not in the literal sense, but in the getting rid of their job sense. All right, so thanks, folks. Let's get action. <laughs>
um, please make um, Naui a campaign uh, you know, organiser here uh, for CAF. Uh, make her feel welcome. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, I'm glad Tim kind of um, ended with kind of uh, the system and actually, you know, the role that politicians um, have had to play um, in really like propping up the mainstream um, far right. But I think that also begs the question as to why it is the case that politicians pretty much everywhere um, around the world uh, use racism, uh, use uh, you know the politics of division uh, to continue um, to rule. And realistically, I think it begs the question, uh, what is the system um, that they are protecting? Uh, how is it that we organize ourselves um, today? Um, and I think that we live in a world that is deeply unequal a world that is filled with racism and a world that is driven uh, by the logic uh, of profits above all else. Um, it is a system uh, that from its very inception um, has required you know, the enslavement uh, of people. It has required uh, really the uh, stealing um, of indigenous land to be able to build their economies and build uh, the profits. Uh, that really is again the logic um, of this system. I think today, especially, we see uh, the continuous construction uh, of borders that divide us. Uh, you know, the system continues to really use uh, nationalism, uh, racist policing uh, to protect, you know, the so-called uh, national interests of a country, which, in my opinion, is just another fancy way of saying uh, the interests um, of the rich. Um, I think that uh, at the moment, uh, this system is, you know, driving uh, towards war and war is something that, you know, is a central uh, component of it because it is actually locked into competition uh, with other nations uh, because it is the only way that they can acquire more land, uh, more resources, uh, and this is extremely uh, profitable. It is a system, uh, like Tim said and a lot of the speakers, that creates institutions that are able to facilitate actually, uh, you know, the dynamics of putting profits above all else that facilitates actually uh, the dynamics of a uh, you know, tiny minority at the top being able to own and control you know, key sections um, of the economy. And because they have these interests, they now have the interests, I think, um, of racism. And I think that you know, the system that you know, we have been describing uh, throughout you know, this entire talk um, is actually the system that delivers us Christchurch. And it's a system that will continue uh, to deliver more uh, Christchurch I think uh, to come. Um, one of kind of like the quotes that I've been uh, thinking a lot about um, is uh, Malcolm X. You know, he was a revolutionary. Um, you know, in the '60s that was fighting quite similar uh, fights, and he said, uh, "You can't have capitalism." without racism. And I think that these words uh, have never been uh, truer uh, than today. So I, I think that in order to understand uh, why horrific events like Christchurch happen, uh, why the rise of the far right is now a prominent political force which is growing in most countries um, around the world, and particularly why the mainstream uh, you know, right has taken up um, increasingly racist rhetoric, uh, we need to look at the political situation in which we find ourselves um, today and specifically what this looks like, um, I think, in a global um, context. So, um, you know, if you cast your mind uh, back to the global financial crisis um, in 2008, uh, mainstream political parties um, and their neoliberal project lost uh, credibility amongst ordinary people. The crisis exposed the true nature of capitalism and really uh, was able to expose that it is a system uh, of accumulation and really will make ordinary people pay uh, for the economic crisis that it is responsible and will do anything in its power to um, achieve that. So the neoliberal project uh, really was like took a hard hit um, from that. And in a way, I think that because uh, political parties have lost so much credibility, they now need to lo like seriously look towards different ways of ruling this you know, seriously unequal um, societies. So parties of the mainstream right in many countries have relied more and more on racist ideas and policies, especially against refugees and Muslims, to regain legitimacy and specifically to deflect blame um, of who really is to blame and is responsible for living standards around the world um, being decimated. 
racism has also you know, been a key tool to justify imperial adventures, um, both abroad, um, but also particularly, I think also in countries, to be able to uh, you know, attack civil liberties. So in Australia, I think you know, a common, I guess, theme is that you can't really go a day without uh, learning about uh, another refugee who has died in one of the concentration camps, uh, you know, another indigenous person being uh, locked up, uh, deaths in custody, uh, you know, the continuous, uh, you know, criminalization and racism directed towards the African communities um, in Melbourne. And I think that the political establishment of the traditional parties have really normalized the terrain in which the far right has been able to essentially, you know, jump uh, off. So they have basically paved uh, the way for the racism um, that the far right has taken up. Um, and I think that Christchurch uh, was a break in the small liberal argument that Australia is not as bad um, as the US. Uh, Christchurch really reflects the fact that politics in Australia have you know, started to uh, truly catch up uh, to uh, the US in the sense that we are now seeing, uh, you know, the rise of the far right in Melbourne, uh, not, you know, just um, after Christchurch, but also the fact that, you know, people have mentioned the elections. Now there is a serious, uh, you know, parliamentary project of various different, you know, far rights to be able to also pursue, um, you know, parliamentary projects to be able to assert their political um, ideas. So, like, also, I guess it you know follows in the traditions of a lot of European countries uh, that today we see uh, you know in the halls of Parliament um, a lot of traditional um, fascist uh, parties getting powered, like in places like Poland, um, the alternative for Deutschland in Germany, and uh, so on and so uh, forth. Um, so yeah, um, I think another important I think. Uh, like key political uh, issue to try and understand Christchurch today is Islamophobia. Um, and Islamophobia is one of the key planks, uh, I think, of modern imperialism and domestic social control. It comes from the top of society and takes the form of wars, domestic anti-terror laws, right-wing media campaigns, police harassment, and structural inequality. Whipping, whipping up hysteria around terrorism has allowed governments to promote uh, you know, national unity in order to uh, get rid of you know, the real threats in society, which is uh, terrorism. So it has allowed them to be able to pursue and really increase the nationalist sentiments because you know, the key enemy now is not you know, us at the top, it is now uh, you know, terrorism and we all have to come behind this um, and you know, follow uh, you know, their own political uh, project. And this has you know, not only served uh, you know, governments around the world uh, to be able to go into the Middle East um, and you know, essentially gain all of the resources uh, that they have, prop up different uh, regimes that are beneficial to governments, particularly uh, the US. Um, but it has also served, I think, to normalize really attacks on uh, civil liberties also um, at home. So I think you know, if you cast your minds back to 9-11, uh, this is kind of like one of the key, uh, you know, kind of like really rises in Islamophobia um, and governments around the world were able to just uh, run with that. Um, so one of kind of like the key defining facts of, uh, you know, later the war um, in Iraq was the, you know, really, they were really able to uh, you know, essentially jump on the Islamophobia that was around um, and justify uh, that war. So a lot of the discussions uh, when they were trying to justify the war in Iraq were particularly um, around, you know, saving women and, you know, really being able to implement democracy into the Middle East. We're really going there to uh, save this country. Uh, but, you know, that is obviously not true. They couldn't really call it, you know, Operation Get All the Fucking Oil. Um, they had to have... Um, you know, a uh, perceived um, excuse um, for that. Uh, so I think that that has been one of the key ways that Islamophobia has been beneficial uh, to capitalism and governments around the world uh, have done that, including Australia backing, um, obviously, a lot of these key wars because it is also one of the key um, allies of the US um, in this region. And I think
think understanding that political dynamic of these two countries also um, allows you to understand, you know, why it is the case that, you know, they continue to back, uh, you know, Israel when it, you know, commits genocides in uh, Palestine and things like that. It is the only way um, that Australia is able to be seen in this area as one of the key imperial countries. Um, and also Australia has their own imperial interests um, in the region. Um, but I also think that it's important to not just say that it's, uh, you know, mainstream parties uh, like the liberals, uh, the Republicans, whatever, um, around the world that have been uh, really driving this. I think it's also important to look at parties like the Democrats and also the Labour Party here uh, that have done either nothing to oppose uh, racism or have actively been participating in doing things in Australia like opening, uh, you know, all of the refugee detention centres and actively um, advocating for tighter immigration restrictions. So I also think uh, that there are no uh, political um, alternative. Uh, there's, you know, also like a lot of examples, I think, to talk about um, in how Islamophobic um, Australian society is. But I think uh, one of the things that we should uh, try and kind of like understand or like maybe have a discussion about is why is the case that the far right has actually taken up um, Islamophobia? Uh, and also, you know, why we think that actually, uh, you know, fascism is also kind of like reflective um, and is growing through Islamophobia. Um, and I think to understand that is, uh, you know, fascist movements are able to take uh, racism that is already um, in the mainstream, being able to integrate that into their politics to build their political movements. So uh, if you think of Reclaim Australia back in you know, 2015 in Melbourne, the key thing uh, that they do is you know, be, being able to cohere um, around Islamophobia, just testing out the waters. You know, Yeah, we just don't really like Islam. We think that immigration uh, you know, should be controlled. Like, how is this fascism? Like, what are you guys talking about? Uh, and later, obviously, some of the key, uh, you know, ideologues uh, that were uh, really trying to get this movement um, off the ground were uh, Blair Cottrell, who is very famously uh, quoted saying that he thought that a picture of Hitler should be hung in every school. Um, so clearly, they are able to run with the current racism and, you know, build it up uh, for their own movements. Fraser Anning came into the limelight after uh, his very you know, infamous speech around you know, the final solution to Muslim migration is what we need. So clearly, I think Islamophobia is central to understanding the far right um, around the world. Um, but you're also here because we're the campaign against racism um, and fascism. And I think that there is a lot to do um, today to oppose uh, the growth of the far right. It is not just desperation uh, that we find. We also actually find in actually opposing the far right that we can also build um, our side, which is, I think, what we need to do um, today. And, you know, the campaign against racism and fascism was started back in 2015. Uh, when we were opposing uh, Reclaim Australia. Um, and we had a few very clear, uh, distinct kind of like thoughts when we formed. One of them was that we do not think that the far right is just going to disappear by itself. We don't think that's going to happen because obviously the mainstream political establishment is, you know, paving the way for them to grow. So we need to actively um, oppose, it, oppose them. And what that looks like is uh, protests on the ground. Uh, you know, we had an amazing rally in Coburg uh, in 2016 when, you know, Blair Cottrell said that he was going to rain uh, force and terror onto the streets of Coburg. Um, and we said, fuck no, we're actually going to mobilize um, against you. This is literally the heartland of, you know, Muslims in Melbourne, and we're actually going to mobilize and oppose you and actually bring the community behind us. Uh, you know, that worked really well in actually sidelining them and not allowing them uh, to grow. So that is clear. We think that we need to mobilize in the here and now to oppose the far right. The second thing I think that we were clear about is that we need a political alternative uh, to the politics of mainstream racism and that we actually need to understand why it is the case that the far right um, is growing and that we need to also politically combat their arguments around demobilizing people. So, you know, we don't think that when we protest them, we give them oxygen. We don't think that, uh, you know, we should debate them uh, nicely. We think that we should actually uh, build the movements that can politically sideline sideline them and also allow us to show that actually in numbers our politics are the politics of uh, you know coming together our politics are the politics of liberation and that's what we're gonna do um, so I think that on that case 
I think that it is important to also be active um, today because you know we're seeing the far right, particularly um, in Australia, uh, trying to embark in you know parliamentary um, elections um, in the federal uh, kind of like elections that are coming up. We see them uh, clearly, uh, you know, wanting to continue to build um, their movement. So I think that on that basis, we need to be organized. And I think that if anyone here uh, wants to actually be committed to organizing um, around these questions, figuring out actually why it is the case that they continue to grow and what you can do in the here and now, well, coming to the um, organizing meetings is what you can do um, in the here and now. Being able to uh, be organized, being able to argue to your friends is what you can do um, in the here and now. Um, and just to um, wrap up, I just wanted to um, read. Uh, just one of the um, experiences of, uh, you know, one of the people who attended the protest um, in Coburg in 2016, uh, because I think that kind of like shows you uh, the importance of pro protesting in the here and now, um, and also, you know, what that does, I think, for uh, people who face the fire um, of the far right. Um, so Rashid uh, was one of like over a hundred, um, you know, young Muslim locals that came down to uh, Coburg to essentially tell the far right to get fucked. Um, and this is what he uh, what he said about um, like his experience um, at the rally. Um, so he said, "Finally, I see so many people standing here together, standing in solidarity. We are united against these bigots, these clowns." Today in Coburg, the establishment and a group of fascists once again tried to use fear to shut down our right to protest against racism. All week, cops in uh, Coburg have been telling us locals to keep away. But today in Coburg, we refuse to be intimidated by fear mongering. We stood together to defend our civil rights and tell Australia we're proud to stand um, against fascism. And I think that that is the kind of energy uh, that you feel and the kind of uh, you know solidarity that you get to bring when you protest um, these people. And I think that today it is you know never been more important to actually uh, you know stand in solidarity uh, with people who are actually facing the fire of these communities, but also you know in that you know, actually, our stakes are also quite high. So, uh, yeah, I think you guys should do stuff. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Naomi.